Good morning. How's everybody this morning? This beautiful fall morning. We don't get many days like this in Iowa, so enjoy what you got. Uh, there's just a few announcements. If you look through the bulletin, we do have a short congregational meeting right after worship this morning, so hang around for that. Uh, there's also an adult forum, or an all-church forum, excuse me, down in, the, uh, in Fellowship Hall just after this to go over some exciting announcements, and uh, there's also an all-church potluck after that, so uh, we're fulfilling your spiritual needs and your your stomach too. Martha. Yeah, speaking of your stomach needs, the coffee and cookies are down there by the setup for the potlucks. So if you're looking for them, they won't be across the hall in the lounge today. They're down in the fellowship hall. And that's where we'll also have the all-church forum where you'll see the results of the study done by the Building Needs Assessment Group. And then during the potluck, you're going to see some of the dishes that say gluten-free. And if you've never been around people who have food allergies, I will, I will give you the drill. It goes like this. Other kinds of food make them sick. And so... Feel free to try the gluten-free stuff. I, I put some out, and they have little labels on them. They're actually pretty tasty. But don't mix the spoons. They'll, yeah, there'll be some spoons specifically in, like, the Sloppy Joe meat. Leave it there. And there's uh, apple crisp that's done with gluten-free oatmeal. And then there's applesauce jello, but just don't mix the spoons because a little bit of that wheat product can make people pretty sick. So. I am always proud of the youth of our church just for who they are. Yet uh, there are times when I am even more proud of them for what they do. And uh, I would like to recognize a few of our youth who participated in the Allstate Music Auditions yesterday. And uh, if you're here, please stand up. Uh, Levi Boston Kemple, Michaela Matthews, um, uh, uh, Hannah Stater, Caitlin DePriest, and Bethany Brooks. These young people spent several hours a day for the last several months preparing for Allstate. They had five, six, seven rehearsals uh, a week and just spent hours of time preparing uh, vocally or instrumentally for Allstate auditions. And hearing these people prepare and audition yesterday just filled me with pride for how talented they are and how well they represent our church and our community. Can you join me in just congratulating these youth for all that they did? And then special congratulations go to Caitlin, who will represent us at the Allstate Vocal Choir. And so congratulations, Caitlin. Well done. Um, this week with Press On, we will be, uh, if the weather holds out, going on our rain date for our trip to the uh, corn maze at Kathy's Pumpkin Patch in Donaldson. Um, I do have some of the transportation permission forms if you still haven't filled those out with their parents. Um, we do need some parent drivers to help us uh, get there and back. Last week for our trip to the Brazil farm, we had 21 youth who made that trip, and so we need drivers. So please see me if you're willing to join us for a fun evening, uh, and you're free to join us in the corn maze. We haven't lost anyone in the maze yet, so it is always a fun evening. Then um, that will be followed up on Friday night. We have our fall lock-in here at the church. Um, we'll meet here at 6 p.m. and go until 11 a.m. Saturday morning. There's a sign-up sheet for that in Fellowship Hall where I would like not only the youth but a parent's signature also to let me know that you know that <laughs> your youth is going to be here at the church. And if you have any specific 
drop off and pick up times other than 6 to 11. Just put those down so I know uh, when we'll see them. Thank you so much. get to put on my moment for mission hat here. I've got four phrases that I've never heard mentioned at First Presbyterian Church. Number one, hey Ed, no fair, it's my turn to sit in the front pew. <laughs> Number two, Bill, I was so enthralled I never noticed your sermon was more than 45 minutes long. <laughs> Number three, hey, since we're all here already, let's start service a half hour early today. And number four, nothing inspires me and strengthens my commitment like our annual stewardship campaign. <laughs> well, guess what? <laughs> it is our annual stewardship campaign. We're living in a very exciting time and crucial time, really, in the life of this church. We have a candidate for a permanent pastor. We have some remodeling opportunities that you hear more about later today. And we have an active group of youth that are getting a reputation outside these walls for caring and outreach. All of this takes commitment and dedication by the entire church, commitment and dedication of both time and treasure. So far in this stewardship campaign, you've received a letter from Jane Crager reminding you of ways that we can give our talents and some of the needs of our church. In the next alert, you'll hear from Bob Brazil asking us to reflect on what we are called to give and in the next few weeks, you'll get a letter from me babbling about something entirely forgettable, and you'll get a pledge card with it. All of this will culminate on Consecration Sunday, November 9th. After that, the session will try to take what is pledged to be given in 2015 and turn it into a workable budget. It's a challenging way to plan the business of the church for the next year, but I believe it's the best way to do it. What I'll ask each of you to do in the next few weeks is think about what your future holds for First Presbyterian Church and what you can do for that future. What commitment and dedication will you have? Last week, Bill challenged us to support a $240,000 budget next year. We know we can do it. We've done this before. It's going to be a challenge, but it's still possible. I'll close with an example of how committed and dedicated we can be here at First Presbyterian Church. This last week, I was in talking with Esther about how the letters and alert article were going to work when her phone rang. Uh, she answered it like she always answered it. First Presbyterian Church, Esther speaking. The caller said, I'm calling about your stewardship campaign, and I want to speak to the chief hog of the trough. Esther said, pardon me? <laughs> he said, I'm calling about your stewardship campaign, and I want to speak to the chief hog of the trough. And Esther, God bless her, said, that's no way to talk about Brian Sinclair. <laughs> He's the chairman of our finance committee and an elder here in the church, and I, I really don't think it's showing him much respect to call him the chief hog of the trough. And the caller said, oh, I'm sorry, ma'am, I didn't mean any disrespect. I just wanted to let him know that I'm planning on pledging $100,000 this year. Esther didn't even blink. She said, just a minute, here comes the big fat pig now. <laughs> Let us stand as we are able for the call to worship. Each morning, God's grace awakens us. Each evening, God's peace cradles us. In every moment, God is present with us. God whispers words which can change our lives. 
When we find ourselves groping in the shadows, God's light will provide a way home. The opening hymn is Come and Fill. Uh, sing it three times, please. We know, despite our sincere efforts to live in God's way, that all too easily we slip off the path to the kingdom. Trusting that God will answer our prayers and forgive us, let us confess our sins as we pray together. Great lover of justice, hear our prayers. Call to treat all people equally. We take sides and pick favorites. Chosen to be your children, we arrogantly assume others are not so long. Give us, giver of rest. Enable us to stop putting you to the test so we can open our hypocritical hearts to your healing touch of compassion and love. As Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, has given all for us, may we give ourselves to you confidently, completely, faithfully. Hear the good news. The one who created goodness and beauty is also the one who shows no partiality, but offers grace and peace to all. God has heard our prayers and done the very thing we ask. Forgive us, heal us, restore us. Thanks be to God.
I'm going to ask you now to open your Bibles to follow along with me as I read from what we believe to be the Word of God, truth for our lives and living. Our reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark. It's kind of refreshing to be back in the Gospels again, familiar territory, not like Second Chronicles, huh? <laughs> Jesus is making his way from the Galilee down to Jerusalem. As this chapter begins, we're told that he is in Judea, in the land beyond the Jordan, which means he's on the east side of the Jordan River, which means he's in modern-day Jordan. As he goes, he is teaching, preaching, trying to help people to understand this radical notion that he has come to proclaim the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? What does it mean? What does it look like? Those who have followed Jesus, the religious leaders, the ordinary people, they are waiting for the kingdom of God to come with a mighty warrior leading a revolution against the Roman Empire. Coming to bring justice. Coming to bring peace. But Jesus' message isn't at all what they expect. It's about a change from the inside out. It's about you and me living differently because of the love, the grace, the mercy of God. The story we're going to read is pretty familiar to many of us. It's the story of the man who comes to Jesus asking what he must do to inherit eternal life. Let us pray as we prepare to hear God speak to us this day. Meet us where we're at this day, O God. Meet us here in this place. Meet us in the midst of our worries, our concerns, our anxieties, our fears, our hopes, our dreams, our joys, our sorrows. Meet us where we're at this day, O oh God. And speak to us a word of life. In Christ. Amen. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He said to Jesus, Teacher, I have kept these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go sell what you own and give the money to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he, the man, heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were perplexed at these words, but Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. 
It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astonished and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. We really stop listening to this passage when we get to the moment in the story where Jesus says to the man, one thing you lack, go and sell all your possessions and give them to the poor, then come and follow me. That's where we stop listening. We can go no farther because we ask the question of ourselves, what if Jesus came to me and asked me to do this thing? And we realize the impossibility of the task. We're in the midst of our stewardship season. And I promised last week that we would take time to talk about money. To talk about our relationship with money, not only money, but our possessions, what they mean, what they say, how we relate to them. Anybody here a Big Bang Theory fan? Did you see it Monday night? Yes? It was all about money and relationships. Big Bang, Big Bang Theory is a, a situation comedy. It's set around these four professor geeks, nerds, call them what you want, who live out in Pasadena, all teach at the local college. It's about the four of them, their friendships, their, their friends, their nuances, their, what would you call it? Their weirdness? <laughs> it's about them and about the women in their lives. One of the four friends, Leonard, is having dinner on Monday night with his girlfriend, off and on girlfriend, now fiance, Penny. And Penny reaches across the table, handing Leonard an envelope full of money. It's bulging with money. She says to him, Leonard, now that I got the new job, and the company I'm working for provides me a car. I took and sold my car, the car that you bought for me, and I want you to have the money back. Leonard takes the envelope, and he looks at it. He says, no, you, you keep it. And Penny says, no, you bought the car. It's your money. You take it. And he says, well, no, 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 you take it. Put it in another fund somewhere. Do something else with it, something you want to do. Maybe set it, save it for the wedding or the honeymoon. And back and forth, it goes the envelope, changing hands, this one and that one. Until frustrated, they turn to one of their friends, Leonard, not Leonard, um, Howard, and his wife, Bernadette, for financial advice on how to deal with money and issues of money in a relationship. Howard assures them that he's fine, that his wife makes a lot more money than he does. But the truth is, he's not. And Bernadette is quick to let Leonard and Penny know she uses money to control 
Howard's behavior. Howard goes out on the refrigerator and he has a list of little task chores he's supposed to do and stars by each of them. And if he gets enough stars, he gets his allowance each week. <laughs> For Leonard and Penny, money in this relationship is about equality. For Penny, it's about being independent, not depending on someone else to provide for her. For Leonard, money is about feeling a sense of being needed, a a sense of maybe belonging, maybe a sense of equality in a relationship. For Howard, it's all about shame. When he thinks of his wife and the money she has and the money he doesn't have, it's a shameful thing. He goes to his room and cries. For Bernadette, it's something to be used to control others. But the question isn't for them. It's about for us. I mean, how is our relationship with money? How do we understand it? What does it mean to us? Like it or not, people make assumptions about us based on whether we have it or we don't, don't we? If I told you I live paycheck to paycheck, week to week, What would you think? You might say, well, that's all right. But how come you're driving a new car? How come you got the big house? Or what if I said to you that I had six months of money put aside, six months of what it would cost me to live? What if I told you that? And still ahead, the new car, the house. What if I told you I could retire tomorrow? And I only had an old car. And a house that needed lots of repair. In the culture we live, money says something about us. And so often we live day in and day out without owning that for ourselves. Without consciously making a decision about our relationship with money, with our possessions. I know a man in his 40s. He had three cars. He could only drive one. He wasn't married, didn't have any children. He was a car guy. Brand new cars. They weren't exotic cars. They weren't fancy cars. They weren't collectible cars. They were just cars. He had one for each weather, I think. Or each season, something like that. He loved cars. He lived with his mother. He worked three jobs. What do you think of this guy? What if I told you he lived with his mother because his mother needed him to be there to help, to give her the support she needed to be independent? How is it that we understand the value of money in our lives? Money says something about what we value, doesn't it? And our relationship with money says something about what we value. How about fear? How about anxiety? 
Can we own that for ourselves? I can. I wonder daily almost. No, not daily. But probably a couple times a week. If I'm going to have enough to make it. Not about today and tomorrow. I mean make it, make it. Make it till I die, make it. You know that kind of make it. I know that I think about it because what do I do? I check the stock market. Why do I check the stock market? Because my retirement is tied in part to the stock market. Do we understand the role of fear and anxiety about tomorrow in our relationship with money? How much is too much? How much is not enough? Our story today is complex. It's a story about this man who we told has great wealth. He has many possessions. In part, the story is complex because there's two things going on here. There's a conversation about eternal life. Jesus says to the man, what must I do to have eternal life? Jesus says to him, what? You know the commands. You shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not commit adultery, bear false witness, honor your father and mother. Lord, I know this. I've done this since I was young. And then Jesus says to him, go and sell all you possess, and give it to the poor. Then come follow me. In a moment, the conversation has changed. This is no longer about eternal life. This is no longer about salvation. This is no longer about what is to come. It is about now about the kingdom of heaven. Jesus tells the man to give what he has to the poor. See, Jesus' heart is for the poor. Jesus' heart in this kingdom of God is about transforming the reality of the world we live in. His heart is for the poor and his heart is for the man. Because Jesus says, your whole identity is found in what you possess. And the kingdom of God is about sharing what we've been blessed with. It's about finding this sweet spot in life where what we have no longer controls what we value. The kingdom of God is about being vulnerable. Have you ever been vulnerable? really vulnerable. I can remember moving to seminary. I was a grown man. At least I like to consider myself a grown man. I was 40 years old. My wife and I, we left jobs to come to Dubuque. We had to have her parents co-sign on a home loan of the small house we bought right across the road from the seminary because we had no income to document. Day in, day out for the next three years, we had to be vulnerable. There was a guy every month sent us $25 and a note. Go get yourselves a pizza. And we would, and we did. And it was a great gift to us. The kingdom of God is about being vulnerable. It's not about how much you have or how little you have. It's about being vulnerable in the midst of life and living. 
It's about learning to trust. To trust God through the midst of the community. It's not about not doing our part. It is about doing our part, but doing our part together. As we get ready for stewardship, to make our pledges, to make our commitments, I don't know what to tell you to do. But I know enough to encourage you to take the opportunity of this season to think about your relationship with what you have. To talk about it with one another. One of the things Brian said of things you'll never hear at church is how much I give. How much I pledge. Have you heard that? Probably not. Don't talk about how much you pledge. Talk about what money means, what possessions mean, what you value. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God's people said, Amen. Our hymn of response is number 333. Please stand as you are able. may be seated. As we prepare for prayer this morning, are there any prayer requests, any joys or concerns? Yes, Diane. Wow, that's wonderful. So Zach competed in a power lifting competition and um, qualified for intercollegiate nationals, finals in the power lifting. And then for, uh, for Logan and Ellie, qualifying for state in track. Cross country, Cross country thanks. Yeah. Oh, Ethan, yes sir. Good. That's a pretty wonderful thing to be able to say about a brother, huh, Thad? <laughs> a joy that you are here. We're glad to. Let us pray this morning. Gracious God, you walk into our house unannounced so often. It's not when we're seeking you, but when we're in the midst of normal life, everyday life, ordinary life, that you come and you speak to us. A word of grace and mercy, a word of hope. And we're grateful for that. We're grateful for the fact that in Christ all things are possible. 
in our lives and in our world. And so it is with that hope that we pray for our world today. While we as a nation grow fearful of Ebola, there are nations being decimated by this disease. And so we pray for those nations, for those people, for families who are experiencing the terror of loved ones dying, of care workers who bring compassion and hope. We pray that through our prayers, and our support, that others in faraway places will know that we care. We pray for those in Seattle who know the horror of a school shooting, of a community in grief, families devastated. We pray for them comfort, peace, hope. We pray for those who hunger today, recognizing that the work we have done in the last year through the Kids Hope Initiative, Kids Against Hunger Initiative, will only make a small dent in those who hunger and thirst. But it is our part, and it is with gladness we do it. We pray in joy today. We pray in joy for the accomplishments of so many, of young people, going off to athletic competitions, Logan, Ellie, Zach, for those who have been blessed with the gift of music and who compete at a high level for the homecoming of a brother, for a time of celebration. We pray too for those in in need of healing for Ken, Carly, Susan, Helen, for Jean, for Judy, for Zane, for Ryan, for each of them we ask for your graces. For Jackie, we ask that you provide for her as she prepares for surgery. For Jean Thompson, We ask that you provide her the strength she needs as she cares for her sister, Joy. For Sean, we pray that you would simply provide for him as he does the work you have called him to. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Let us respond to the fullness of God's grace poured over each of us and all of us. Let us receive this morning's offering.
may be seated. This time we're going to go ahead and proceed with our congregational meeting. If you need to excuse yourself, feel free to do that. At this time, I would uh, ask our clerk of session, Ed, do we have a quorum? Yes, I do believe we have a quorum. Great. Let us pray. Gracious God, you have called us as your church in this place, and generation after generation, you have raised up men and women to lead us and to care for us. So be present with us here in this place as we do the work you have charged us with and called us to. It is our prayer in Christ. Amen. We have one thing uh, to do this morning, and that is to elect officers for the coming year. At this time, I'm going to have Bryce come forward to report to you uh, the report of the nominating committee. Uh. From the nominating committee, we have uh, approached uh, people to be elders for the class of 2017. Bryce, I'm just going to uh, invite people, if they'd like to look in the back of their bulletins, you're going to see the list he's about to read. Okay. 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 Uh, Jason Lichty, Betty Lau, Barb Wielander, and for the class of 2015, Claudia Streeter and Mary Beth Young. For deacons in the class of 2017, Levi Boston Kempel, Adam Krieger, and Mike Vincent. Bryce, do you place those names in nomination? Yes, we do. Is there a second? Are there any other nominations from the floor? Okay. So. There's a motion, and it has been seconded to cease the, um, the nominations from the floor. And Dwayne, you have to help me with the second part, but that the clerk recorded as a nan an, an, unanimous, unanimous ballot. We have to vote on the motion to cease first. And so I do need to call for that. Is there all those in favor of ceasing nominations? Say yes. Yes. Opposed? Great. Now we move to the motion of electing those officers that have been nominated by your nominating committee. Are you ready to vote? Yes. Okay. All those in favor say yes. Yes. Opposed? That motion carries. I would tell you that we do lack one more elder for the class of 2017. Is that correct? Correct. Right. And we will, uh, the nominating committee will continue to work toward that. But good work to, uh, to you, Bryce, and to the whole committee for their good work. And thank you to all of you for your support of their work. Let us pray. Gracious God, we pray now for the leaders of this church, those who have been called to, to lead us as elders and those who have been called to care for us as deacons. We ask that you would provide for them wisdom and courage, that you would give them compassion and gentleness as they do the work you have cared, uh, called them to. Um, help us as members of this community to support and encourage them in what we say and do. This is our prayer in Christ Jesus. Amen. All those in favor of adjourning, if you please stand. Receive now God's blessing. May God bless you and keep you. May God make God's face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the fullness of God's presence, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the whole darn works, indwell you. And may you have God's peace this day and forevermore. Amen.